he founded the Center for Men's Health, serving three states and served as director of urology for his primary hospital. And Dr. Baga, I really look forward to you specifically telling us a bit about um, the men's health network that you put together. It's, it's actually one of the reasons that I'm excited to be here tonight. And we have two sex therapists from Whole Heart working with a urologist to talk about how we collaborate to, to offer comprehensive care. Um, and I think the work you did with men's health is really just precisely encapsulating that collaborative effort. And it's wonderful. Um, Dr. Baga cares for both male and female patients and provides thoughtful, holistic medical surgical care for issues such as urinary problems from bladder or prostate issues, erectile dysfunction, including implant surgery, testosterone deficiency, and Peyronie's disease. Uh, he is a skilled reconstructive urologist with extensive experience in the management of urethral structures fistulas, and other complex genitourinary abnormalities. Um, he's also strongly experienced in the care of urinary stone disease, including minimally invasive stone removal, uh, the diagnosis and management of genitourinary cancers, and general urology. He has performed thousands of procedures and cared for countless patients and believes every procedure and patient to be unique and important. So welcome, Dr. Baga. So glad you're here tonight. Um, let me also please introduce to you uh, Dr. Erin Kemble, who is one of my um, co-workers and therapists here at uh, Whole Heart. Um, he currently serves as a clinical therapy associate for both uh, A Place for Me Counseling and Whole Heart Psychotherapy. Um, he is a multifaceted clinician uh, focusing on assisting clients through holistic healing of the body, mind, and spirit. Uh, he utilizes cognitive behavioral therapy, psychodynamic, and emotionally focused therapies to assist individuals, couples, and families in achieving their mental health goals. Um, he specializes in treating clients with sexual health issues, grief, narcissism, uh, the LGBTQ plus community and social justice concerns. Um, and he is uh, literally the best dresser I know. <laughs> so I'm always loving seeing what his latest outfit is. Um, and then I'll just introduce myself a little bit. My name is Chris Devinney. I am a counselor here at Whole Heart. Um, my focus is on working with individuals couples. And I also work with um, folks who are in poly uh, relationship structures as well. Um, I am fascinated by everything related to human sexuality and have been studying it for quite a while. And this is a, for me, this is a second career. I have a past professional life in uh, policy work and advocacy and um, lobbying, even at all levels of the government. And I will tell you that the diplomacy skills that I learned there serve me very well, working with couples who are in distress sometimes and individuals. So um, so we're a bit of the team tonight. We're, we're going to be having a conversation. Dr. Baga is going to kick it off for us. Um, we will be spending some time talking and offering a presentation. There will be questions at the end. So if you have some questions, please put them in the chat. We are monitoring the chat and we'll save some time at the end um, to do that. But with that, Dr. Baga, would you please get us going tonight? Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. That was awesome. Really appreciate the, uh, the intro and all the info. I'm excited to hear from you all as well. And, uh, you know, we're, like you said, we're going to keep this a little bit casual, want to keep this educational, leave plenty of time for questions. And, you know, but you got to have an agenda. We're going to talk about erectile dysfunction and, you know, what it is, what causes an erection and what keeps it from occurring. And then we'll also talk about your side of things in terms of sex therapy and how that can help uh, and some, uh, you know, the prevalence of it, which is a lot more common than folks may think. All right, so what is an erection? Most people know, but you know, that's being able to get in a, get, being able to have a firm penile phallus so it can be used for an erection. And I define 
erectile dysfunction, it's a very individual thing because people want erections for different periods of time. Obviously, there are uh, limits in terms of how long you should be able to have one and, you know, limits to what's too long. You've probably seen those commercials for Viagra where they say, hey, if it's been four hours, you bet to get to an ER because sometimes it's not medically okay. But basically, it's based on the patient. It's the ability to get an erection sufficient for satisfying sexual activity. So I ask the patient specifically, is this good enough for you? And how can I help you get there? All right. So the way an erection occurs is actually due to blood flow. So when uh, a person gets aroused, they, the nerves send signals to the blood vessels that are within the penis. And what happens is all these little blood vessels, it's a network of blood vessels, like a sponge, like you can see in that cross section picture down there. And it all opens up and dilates when the nerves tell it to open up. That opening up allows all the blood to rush in there. And on the back end, it closes off. And so the blood is actually held within the, the penile shaft. It's not until we're done with sexual activity that a different set of nerves tells us to do the opposite. It opens the, ner the, the, uh, the blockage in the back and then literally squeezes all of the blood out. And that's the way the erection goes away. So what causes erectile dysfunction? Honestly, it's those top three that are the most important. If there's an issue with the blood vessels, so the blood getting in, issue with the nerves, which is your on off switch, which is telling the blood whether it can come in or not, or an issue with testosterone. Those are really the top three. The other four I deal with quite a bit as well, medications because they inhibit the way the nerves work. Surgical also messes with the blood vessels and the nerves, trauma the same, Peyronie's disease, another specialized situation. Maybe we can get to those later, but I wanna talk about those top three. How do the blood vessels, nerves, and testosterone cause an issue? So the, the blood vessels, when there's a blood vessel issue, we call it vasculogenic erectile dysfunction. And I'll tell you by far, this is the most common cause of erectile dysfunction. The same stuff that you hear about that occurs in the heart, where those blood vessels start to get hardened and start to not be able to stretch is exactly what's happening in the penis. And I use that analogy because we hear so much about the heart, but obviously not quite as much about the penis. Maybe it's more difficult to talk about uh, in a public setting, but those same things are happening. Atherosclerosis and endothelial dysfunction, arterial disease is keeping those blood vessels from stretching out. The difference is that the blood vessels that are inside of the penis are much more delicate and get affected a lot earlier. And that's why if you look at the bottom, look at the difference at all of these other, all of the blood vessels, um, the one that's, apply, that's uh, supplying the heart is already two to three times as large as the one inside the penis. So it's very important to know that this can happen a lot earlier. We hear about heart disease occurring in people's 40s and even 50s. Well, erectile dysfunction can even occur before for some folks. And this is something I really drive home. You know, heart health is penis health, penis health is heart health. I tell all my patients this first. Um, we hear about, we often hear about, you know, if you have a family history of heart disease, that you're more likely to have heart disease in the future. Well, having an erectile dysfunction is just as high of a risk factor for heart disease as a family history. So they are so closely linked together. Um, and like it says over there, erectile dysfunction can precede coronary artery disease in almost 70% of cases, obviously for males. Um, so this is why I tell people, before we start dealing with the other stuff, like the tablets and the injections and all the other ways that we can handle your erections, we got to make sure your heart is in check as well. Diet, exercise, you know, having a high fiber, low fat diet, good amount of cardiovascular exercise three to four times a week, get that heart rate up uh, and sustain it for 20 to 30 minutes. Make sure you're monitoring your cholesterol levels, your blood pressure, diabetic health. All of this is incredibly important. Not only is it going to help your overall health, but it actually will improve your erections over time. And I tell people when I'm giving you medications, my hope is that this is temporary, because if you can deal with the root causes, we can get rid of those medications later. The other cause is testosterone related. So testosterone is very interesting. Um, 
testosterone actually is not is responsible for erections to some degree but is also responsible for libido so that's the intermediary by which it puts most of its effect so if you have a low testosterone you can have a lower libido and with a lower libido it's much harder to get an erection of course there is a little bit of a direct effect as well and we know this um when we're younger and our testosterone levels for males are as high as they're ever going to be, you have morning erections. And that's because testosterone will peak at a certain time early in the morning, and that helps you get an erection as well. How many men have low testosterone? Almost all men will have a decline in testosterone as we get older, but our body adapts to it under most situations. Your testosterone for a male will actually peak around age 35. It then goes down you know, up to 17% over 10, year, um, 10 years in age. But on average, it's about 1% per year when you consider all years of over a lifespan. However, it goes down faster for men who have obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, prostate issues, COPD, all of these sort of things increase the decline of testosterone to a way that your body can't really cope with it. And that can end up having a more significant change in your libido and erectile function as a result. Then there are nerve-related causes. So where do you talk about the blood vessels as being the major um, contributor to erections? But something's got to tell those erections to, tell those blood vessels to open up and to close. And so I tell people the nerves are like the on and the off switch. It's actually a very fascinating thing, the way nerves work on the uh, penis for erections. But if we're going to make it really simple, there are three types of nerves. There's the parasympathetics, the sympathetics, and the somatics. The parasympathetic nerves are your on switch. Your sympathetic nerves are your off switch. And the somatic nerves are responsible for sensation, orgasm, things like that. But it's not as simple as an on off switch. It never is, right? The parasympathetic nerves and the sympathetic nerves are always kind of fighting each other. Uh, and whichever one is having a higher influence on the penis, that's where the decision will be made, whether there's going to be more blood or less blood. And that's how the erection is, you know, occurs or goes away. Causes of imbalance, if you have any sort of nerve damage, nerve damage is very common in folks with diabetes. Uh, traumatic causes, so people who have had injuries, people with neurologic conditions, you have a stroke, God forbid, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, things like that. Medications will actually mess with the neuro neurotransmitters as well. It kind of upset that balance between the parasympathetics and sympathetics. Um, and then that imbalance will cause issues. The way I kind of help patients visualize it is when a person has an orgasm, they've got a sympathetic surge right afterwards, and that's why the erection goes away so fast. And so you can see why any change in the amount of uh, nerve stimulation can make a really profound difference in a person's ability to get and keep an erection. So how do we treat erectile dysfunction? The most common way, of course, oral medications, you've heard about Viagra, Levitra, Stendra, Cialis, all that sort of stuff. How do they work? What they're kind of doing is they're bypassing some of the nerve signals. So you don't have, require quite as much of a strong parasympathetic signal to tell the blood vessels to open. And they also force the blood vessels to open, even though they're a little bit diseased. You know, the history behind Viagra is just amazing. It was actually developed as a heart medication. Uh, and what had happened was it had been distributed during a clinical trial to all these uh, folks to see if it would help. And at the end of the day, it didn't really pan out to be a great heart medication to prove blood flow to the heart. But they found that a lot of men were not returning the medication. Uh, and then they were doing these interviews afterwards. They found out, well, they're actually started to admit, well, we're getting better erections, so we want to keep the rest of it. And that's how Pfizer, the company that developed Viagra, kind of knew they were onto something. Um, but that's, that's how they work. They force those blood vessels to open a little bit more, even though they're diseased and also bypass some of those nerve kind of signaling issues and force the blood vessels to open. Anyway, they push that on switch. How effective are they? They're actually quite effective for earlier erectile dysfunction as the blood vessels get more diseased or the nerves are being too overwhelmed. They won't work, uh, but they are quite effective initially. Side effects, dizziness, lightheadedness, is kind of reported. Color changes in visions is reported as well. 
If you take too much of it, you can have an erection that won't go away. But honestly, if it's taken in a responsible way, it tends to work very well. You can go forward a couple there, Jamil. One more. There we go. Another option is a vacuum erection device. So this actually is a device that goes on the end of the penis and it works on a suction. So what it does, is actually sucking the blood into the penis using a vacuum. Uh, and then the most important thing about this is that ring that's close to the base of the penis, that's causing a constriction. So it holds the blood in place. Very effective, but also very inconvenient to be very honest. Um, I find that the patients that find the most use from this are actually ones where the couple is involved uh, because it's very hard to do this independently. Uh, you really need to have both people involved and kind of make it part of your sexual routine. And for those folks, I've found it can be quite effective. Also, sometimes people will combine things. So they'll take the Viagra, but maybe it's not working quite as well as they'd like, and they add the vacuum erection device on top of that, and they can find a good combination. Risks are rare when used responsibly, to be very honest. Injection therapy, this looks crazy, it looks bonkers, but it's actually very effective. This is basically like a liquid Viagra. So why can't you just keep going up and up on your Viagra? Because when you take it by mouth, it dilutes throughout the whole body and cause issues. Take too much, it can affect your heart, which is what it was originally trying to be developed for, or your head, your lungs, and that sort of stuff, and cause issues. But if we could directly deliver that medication to the penis and have it stay there, we could use extremely potent or very strong formulations of medication. And that's the principle by which injection therapy works. It's called alprosidil, trimix, bimix, um, prash. There are different names that are used for it. But essentially what you're doing is you're taking a tiny needle, and I like to emphasize tiny because it really is. It's like the type of needle that a person uses to deliver insulin to themselves. They draw it up and then they inject it directly into the penis. And yes, it does look crazy, but the needle is tiny. Um, folks say that they barely can feel it, uh, and uh, it's very, very profound. The effect for most people, it can occur within, you know, minutes. Uh, some cautions, though, you got to know how to do it right. If you do it the wrong way, you can cause scar tissue. Some people do have pain because they can react to the medicine, uh, so we need to teach people how to do it beforehand. Also, unfortunately, it's quite pricey and not well covered by insurance, so that's another reason why we find some, you know, um, lack of use. Urethral suppository, let's just skip this one. It looks, as, it looks as bad as it is. You know, you're putting a suppository through the penis, but as it goes in, it causes some trauma in the urethra. I've mostly stopped recommending this. I wanted to put it in the presentation so, you know, folks are aware of it, um, but it really doesn't seem to work that well for most folks um, and can cause a lot of irritation and kind of burning with urination as well. So we usually avoid that. Next is actually a very interesting one. It's called low intensity shockwave therapy. Uh, so this is something I'm very excited about. I was involved in some of the initial research trials in San Francisco when they were starting to evaluate this type of therapy for other reasons. Uh, but what it's basically doing is it is causing tiny micro traumas painlessly into the penis uh, using shockwave energy with ultrasound energy. And what that does is it does two things. Number one, it kind of shakes loose some of that atherosclerosis and allows it the blood vessels to get a little bit healthier. But more importantly, it's causing what's called neovascularization. And what that does is with this tiny micro trauma, the body reacts by sending signals and forming new blood vessels inside of the penis. Uh, and that can actually help um, increase blood flow towards the penis. How effective is it? It's very effective, but it's most effective at very early erectile dysfunction. Um, I think it's been inappropriately used in folks who have this severe erectile dysfunction or people who have major nerve issues because it won't help with those two things. But with early vascular um, erectile dysfunction, if it's caught and properly diagnosed, it can actually be very uh, useful and it's not painful at all. Last is penile implant surgery. This is something I've done many, 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 many times, but I always tell people it is the last thing to do. So for folks who have tried everything and nothing is working, 
very severe diabetes, for example, that took a long time to get under control and they've done irreparable damage to their nerves. Surgical cases where they've had, you know, the prostate surgery and the nerves have actually been severed. Other sorts of issues like that. An implant is actually a great device. Um, it uh, actually works like almost like a water balloon. So there's two cylindrical water balloons inside of the penis uh, that when, um, when filled with the water, it's all internal, nothing's on the outside of the body. There's a little pump in the scrotum and it pushes the, the water into these water balloons. It causes an erection, you get deflate, goes back down again. It's pretty an ingenious device. We're not um, affecting the somatic nerves. So you still get the orgasm and things like that and the sensation like you would. It's covered by insurance, which is great. Uh, so it's a great device, but again, it's a surgery. There's always a risk with surgery like infection and pain. Um, and it only lasts about 10 years because it is a man-made device. So, you know, we kind of leave that as the last option. We like to, to take care of uh, it other ways first if possible. The other thing before I hand it off is, you know, I want to talk a little bit about psychogenic erectile dysfunction. So this is a very common cause of erectile dysfunction that's often overlooked. I actually hate the term psychogenic just because in, in the public eye, especially when I talk to patients, they seem to think that, oh, this just means this is in my head, right? No, it's actually very different. This is actually the pathway by which um, the nerves are affected. So it's right back down to that signaling imbalance. You've got the on switch and the off switch. The parasympathetics are the on and the sympathetics are the off and they're constantly kind of working against each other. But if you have certain triggers that push that sympathetic um, nervous system to increase, stress, anxiety, relationship issues, stress is not only, you know, not only emotional stress, but also physical stress. I see with people that go from day shift to night shift, you know, night shift to day shift, people with stressful, you know, um, physical jobs, people aren't getting enough sleep, situational changes in their relationships, performance anxiety, where a person gets really stressed, can't get an erection, push that sympathetic uh, nervous system up, then they get more stressed, then they release more sympathetic, you know, hormones, then they get more stressed. It's this downward kind of cycle. And that sympathetic nervous system is so far on that that parasympathetic has no chance to force the blood in. And that's psychogenic erectile dysfunction. That's often best dealt with, you know, um, a sex therapist often, uh, and also kind of recognizing those triggers. So I'll usually kind of help start things off, recognizing triggers, watching out for them. Maybe I'll start a low dose Cialis to kind of bypass that nerve system for a while regain your uh, confidence, things like that, and then wean off of those medications once we've dealt with some of the more of the root cause. Uh, and with that, I'm going to, you know, pass it along. I'd really love to hear more from our uh, friends at Whole Heart. Thank you, Dr. Baga. I am, um, I'm a total sex nerd. So I am, I've learned something new here today in just hearing about some of your treatments. Um, so that's really fascinating. I have lots of questions. I'll take them offline later. Um, <laughs> let me tell you a little bit about what Aaron and I do here along with the other um, sex therapists that are at Whole Heart. Um, this is, uh, I'm a little biased, but I'm going to tell you, I think we're one of the best practices in town. Um, Erica Pluhar, who uh, runs our side of the sex therapy program, is um, she's just phenomenal. And so we're all... We all get to work under her and with uh, collaborating with her. But what is sex therapy? People like have a lot of different ideas about what it is, and some of them, some of them are you know are interesting. Um, what it is is a specialized form of talk therapy um, that very simply focuses on improving sexual functioning and satisfaction. Um, we work with folks a lot of the time who where maybe there's desire discrepancy, people are experiencing painful sex, um, uh, orgasm, having difficulty orgasming, um, delayed ejaculation, sometimes there's rapid orgasm um, that folks are dealing with, um, and working through what is going on for them, what are the factors um, that might be impacting them that Dr. Baga just mentioned. So 
Obviously, there are the biological factors that we just talked about. Um, but then we also work together with the clients to figure out what are all the other myriad of factors that might be impacting, you know, how your body is showing up for you predictably or not, um, what's, what's going on there. And so that part is integrated with this couple and relationship therapy that we do. Um, and, and also some at home exercises. Uh, some people refer to it as homework. I like to refer to it as fun work. Um, sometimes clients agree with me and sometimes they don't, <laughs> depending on, you know, where they are in their journey. Um, what sex therapy is not is you don't have to be concerned that we're going to be touching you. I actually had a client who asked me early on when, when she came in, she's like, no, you're not going to touch me, are you? And I said, no, 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 this is, this is talk therapy. Um, so <laughs> from the work that we do, that's what we're doing. It's collaborative work, talk therapy with, with the clients. So we are always approaching this from a systems perspective. Um, just as we're talking here with a medical provider who can really speak to the biological side of things, um, with every client, couple, individual, poly structures, Whenever I'm talking to them, I'm trying to work through with them, what are the biological factors that are in play for you? Um, as we heard, you've already heard about what most of those are. And we do a check for that kind of on our side. And then we refer out if it sounds like, oh, it sounds like you might be dealing with something that you, we need to coordinate care with a medical provider for you. Um, the psychological factors that we're looking at are kind of what are people's set points for anxiety and depression? What are they dealing with in their lives? What, how is the stress showing up in their lives? Have they experienced um, trauma in their past? Have they experienced, you know, sort of lowercase t trauma, chronic stress over time that's impacted them? Um, how's that showing up for them? where they come from in terms of their um, cultural background or their family of origin. If, um, you know, what was the messaging that you got growing up and how has it impacted you? Um, we often work with a lot of clients who, you know, grew up in families where um, maybe there was strict religious adherence and they got messages that, um, that they're still wrestling with. You know, they're sort of trying to reconcile being a human being with a sex drive and sexual desires with, you know, butting up against some of those messages that they received. And then the social piece, this is that relational piece. It's how is your relationship? How do you feel with your partner right now? Are you good? What's the dynamic between the two of you? You know, when you reach vulnerably for your partner, how does your partner respond? Do they meet you in your vulnerability? If you're not met in your vulnerability, what does that trigger in you? What then are the actions that you take when you're triggered? And then how does that impact this whole dynamic between the two of you? And all of this is the atmosphere in which people are trying to connect sexually. And then you put the cultural stuff, you know, which is the atmosphere for us all. And given people's different backgrounds and experiences, like parts, of the cultural um, piece can really be large factors that we have to be sensitive to and understand and get and get a real feel for how those are in play in therapy. All right, Chris, thank you. Um, let's look at some statistics that uh, a lot of uh, clients that come into our offices don't actually know. A lot of people overall don't actually know. But let's look at some uh, uh, important statistics. So 52% of men experience some form of erectile dysfunction. So as we uh, actually look into the specifics of the uh, statistics, this increases as we age uh, between the ages of 40 and 70 and, and thereafter as well. However, one important statistic, 26% of men uh, under the age of 40 are affected with erectile dysfunction. Um, additionally, 26, or 20% 20 
of uh, sexual encounters involve men unable to keep an erection. And you guys may be asking, why is this important? And I'll explain why this is actually important. Um, this is important because in our treatment, we want to begin to normalize this. Uh, and we also want to make certain that our clients uh, do not necessarily feel isolated or that they are the only ones that are experiencing these types of concerns. Um, another reason why we actually do this, we explain these statistics, is simply because we want to focus it as a part of our treatment plan. So when you are able, as a client, uh, to accept some of these uh, statistics, we're able to guide and gauge a treatment plan that is important and that focuses specifically on the acceptance and, of course, the, um, the alternative ways in which we can uh, focus on, on treatment. Uh, one of the things that I do want to highlight, and it's actually highlighted in red here, is that erectile dysfunction is one of the most, the most rather, prevalent sexual dysfunction that is happening among men. And this happens not just here in America, but across the globe. Next slide, please. So one of the things that's, that's actually important, and Dr. Baga talked about it, Chris uh, alluded to it uh, earlier, was the concept that as we grow older, uh, we actually decrease, or some of our functionality actually decreases. Um, our libido decreases, our sexual drive decreases, and sometimes our desire actually decreases. In between the ages of 50 and 70, you have a 15% chance of decreased sexual desire. And what does that actually mean? Sometimes that leads to what we consider shame, as you all see here. So when we think about shame, shame is legitimately the belief that I am something bad. Guilt on the opposite end, or very similar, I should say, is that I've done something bad, but shame is that I am bad. And I want us to think about this in terms of what we consider the male ego. Um, I have a bunch of clients that come to me and they say, Dr. Aaron, listen, you know, I am a young man, I'm 20 years old, and this is supposed to be working. I'm a man, it's supposed to work. And unfortunately, sometimes that's not the case. Um, I have men that come to me who are in their mid 40s, some of them are in their 60s, and they're saying, you know, this is supposed to be working, I'm a man. However, sometimes biology says, and as we've learned earlier, um, history dictates that sometimes that's not the case. Let's think about this, um, and the men that are actually on this call, let's think about this. Society tells us that the male ego facilitates a lot of sexual desire. It also facilitates a lot of how we feel about ourselves, our self-esteem. Um, I mean, if we were to be real and be frank about this, uh, society tells us that, hey, if you're a man, you have a penis, it's supposed to be working, it's supposed to be working all the time, and it's continuously supposed to be working. And if it doesn't, there's a lot of shame that gets involved. Let's also think about if we can, um, if we can go back to when we were younger, for me, it was a few years ago, uh, I kid. But if we were to think about when we were in lock, uh, locker rooms, we thought about the mentality of, of locker rooms. The mentality of locker rooms is, you know, you're the male, you're the stud, and you're going to have sex with as many people as you possibly can because that is what society promulgates throughout. Let's also think about what society says in regard to uh, what sex is supposed to be. Sex is supposed to be performative. Sex is actually supposed to be um, competitive. They don't teach us as men, oftentimes, that sex is supposed to be pleasurable or um, for connection or feelings any of those things. So as men, once we get that in our heads and we don't measure up obviously to what society states or what we've 
been taught in our families, our families of origin, or even within our friend groups. What happens is we suppress oftentimes um, those feelings, those emotions. And what happens after we suppress? As men, what we typically do is we fall into what we consider a, an unhealthy sexual cycle. So if we were to look at the unhealthy sexual cycle. Next slide, please. That unhealthy sexual cycle is, is very performance-based. So let me explain what I mean by it being performance-based. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, with, with Chris uh, when we talk about treatment. So performance focus is simply like this. And I'll give you a concrete example as well. So let's say, for example, my partner comes in and, and she touches me. And what happens is I automatically think if she touches me, I have to perform. Like, oh my gosh, I have to perform. You know, I, I have to be ready to go because she's touching me. So automatically what happens is we send a signal to our brains. I have to perform. I'm afraid to perform. So what's going to happen next? And then we begin to formulate the narrative or conversations in our heads regarding what performance is and regarding what performance is not. And then we start to get those psychosomatic feelings. So I call them anxiety. Um, we become tense, our heart rate gets quicker and, and uh, our bodies lock up sometimes. We become stiff. And what's happening is our mind is sending a signal to our, I'm sorry, our body sending a signal to our mind. And what it's saying is, I have to perform. I am uncomfortable with performing. And what happens is that signal goes right back to our penis and it says, maybe. It's not time to perform right now. And so we either, the erection disappears or it actually diminishes. That cycle continues, unfortunately, in such a way that we begin to create in our minds the narrative that if I get touched, if my partner touches me, if my partner is, is flirty, I have to actually perform. Let's look at an example real quickly. And we're gonna focus heavily on uh, the BIPOC uh, community when we're talking about uh, the example of, of performance. So uh, there was a show, great show. Uh, it actually ended uh, last year called Insecure uh, with the phenomenal Issa Rae. And uh, during this particular show, I wanna say it was season three or season four, uh, there was a main character, the main protagonist, whose name was Lawrence. Lawrence met these two beautiful women uh, at a grocery store. And uh, he met them, they had conversation and ended up going back to his place to have a sexual encounter. And they had a sexual encounter. And shortly thereafter, I think the encounter may have lasted, you know, in real time, maybe, you know, half an hour or so. Uh, shortly after, what happened was the two women who happened to be of a different race than uh, Lawrence was said to him, hey, can we go again? And after seemingly satisfying uh, those two women, Lawrence was like, no, I, I actually can't go again. And so the two women literally looked over and began to berate Lawrence and said, you know, why don't we call Darnell? And Darnell is someone who can actually continue to be hard and perform. And what that did for Lawrence is, and he actually said it, was that it created a lot of shame. It created a lot of shame and it created a lot of guilt in the performance cycle. This happens quite often. And for not only just for men of color, but for a lot of men, most men, when we are deemed, uh, to be a sexual performer, and we're deemed to be someone who is almost robotic to a certain extent. It takes the pleasure, and it also takes the, the uh, cognitive functioning away from the sexual experience. It almost makes it rudimentary. It almost makes it um, 
an experience that is filled with uh, dehumanization, so to speak. All right, next slide, please. So this comes into some of the directives and homework that we often offer couples who, you know, they're feeling disconnected or maybe erections haven't been predictable for long enough and the that part of the couple starts to become afraid to even uh, touch their partner or kiss their partner because they're afraid it might lead to sex and they're worried their body's not going to show up for them the way they want it to. And so couples often get into this cycle where they're they're pretty touch starved after a while. They're quite disconnected from each other. And as you can imagine, it's kind of a heavy lift to try and get couples back into actually into bed with each other, having sex with each other, um, making use of an erect penis if it's in the mix for them um, when they're when they're kind of out of practice touching each other. So one of this is one of the uh, oldest um, types of homework that was created in the field of sex therapy by Masters and Johnson, who, if you've heard of them, are um, they're they're luminaries in the field. They were they were the original um, sex researchers. Um, so sensate focus is actually a mindfulness touching exercise. It is not for the purpose of having sex. Um, it has different levels to it, but the first level that a couple will start out with is um, it's uh, touching, and the goal is to be naked while you're doing it, by the way, um, but sometimes folks need to modify. Maybe they'll wear their, their underwear or something as they're, you know, taking baby steps back toward each other and bridging that physical connection with each other again, just to try and warm the connection between them. Uh, via touch. And essentially what you're doing is they are touch sessions, um, about 15 minutes a piece. One person is the toucher, the other person is the touchy, and then you shift. Um, and all you're doing is exploring the other person's body as the toucher um, for your own curiosity. And all you're doing is noticing, what am I, what am I experiencing as I touch my partner? Uh, what am I experiencing in terms of the texture of their skin or their hair on these different parts of their body? What is the temperature, you know, on this body part? Um, what is it like when I adjust the pressure? What's really interesting about this exercise, and many couples don't like it to start out with because it's kind of an awkward thing. It's not what people are used to. Um, but if they'll stick with it, um, and process it and talk about what they did like. What's really interesting is many couple clients start to say, you know, I'm really feeling more connected to my partner. It's nice to be able to touch each other with no pressure that this is going to, that, that we're headed towards sex. And if the pressure's gone, all of a sudden I can relax. I can be here. I'm in my, I'm in my, uh, parasympathetic nervous system, which is um, rest and digest. So when you get into the sympathetic nervous system, which Dr. Barga was talking about earlier, that's fight or flight. And erections and fight or flight mode, they just don't really mix. Um, next slide, please. This is another exercise that we often give our couples, which is, um, so it's called the hour touch menu. And it's it's about not just what, you know, it's not like, don't just tell me what you don't like in the bedroom. Tell me what you do like in terms of touch. But this is not just in the bedroom. It, it really is about what do you like in terms of affectionate touch, um, such as a hand holding, cuddling. Do you have a ritual of hello and goodbye kisses? Um, do you rest your partner, your hand on your partner's leg? Like, how do you show affection to your partner? Um, and then there's sensual non-demand touching. So for many people, this might be cuddling naked with your partner, um, doing back and shoulder rubs, taking showers together. And then there's the genital and erotic touch, which, um, you know, is what you 
think that it is. Um, it's more sexual in nature. But what we try to get our clients to do is to have each partner describe what they really like within these areas of touch. And in the Venn diagram of what these couples like, you know, what is the overlap? And, and, and can we focus, can you focus on that? Like what really turns you on and what not just turns you on, but what feels good, what feels connecting, what feels pleasurable, but what feels maybe also um, non-pressured. Um, next slide, please. Ah, so this is, this is just a case example of a client that I have worked with um, who is just a lovely, human being, um, early 30s, male, cisgendered, heterosexual. Um, in his first, this wasn't his first relationship, but it was it was the first important relationship to him. Um, and he, he did in the past, he'd had some sexual experiences. Sometimes, sometimes his body would show up for him in predictable ways and sometimes it wouldn't. Um, he did have a hormonal workup noticed he was low level of testosterone, but within the clinical range, but close to the close to the floor of what was typical for a guy his age. Um, he really, you know, so when he came to me, um, he said, you know, this, this, this person is really important to me. I feel like I've found my person. I'm really afraid that if I don't fix this problem, she's going to leave me. And that's so common. Of course, you're like, I, I love this person. I want to show up for them. And I get really worried. What, what if my body won't show up for me? You know, and what if it happens enough that she's like, I'm out, um, which happens from time to time. So that, you know, what we talked through was kind of how he is, what his own set points are in terms of anxiety and things that he worries about. We talked about um, something that wasn't in the slides today, but I, I recommend um, Emily Nagoski has written a book called Come As You Are. And she talks about the dual control model um, of essentially what are the things that are your sexual accelerators? They make you wanna go to sex, they make you wanna have sex. And what are the things that hit your brakes? What are your sexual breaks? And then there's a, a third piece, which is how sensitive to context are you? And what that means is, do things have to be just right for you in order to feel okay having sex? And you know, this client that I was working with, we kind of talked through what his accelerators and breaks were, and he had kind of sensitive breaks at times, but he was also really sensitive to context. So, <laughs> prone to some anxiety, a little bit prone to like, let me make sure everything, like everything in the house is done or the, the, the house is clean. And then it's almost like, then my mind can be where my body is. So we had to talk about, you know, doing a little work of leaning into letting go of, of some of that as well. Um, he also had, um, a way uh, of self-pleasuring that was not, he was not going to experience that with his partner in penetrative sex. And sometimes that's part of the issue is how someone is masturbating. It, it, and if they get really, really used to that, um, it can be something you have to back off from for a while or practice, you know, mindful masturbation sometimes looks like what's the dominant, if, if you're stroking your penis, what is your dominant hand? How about try it with your non-dominant hand? See what that's like, you know? So, and it would be obviously a very different experience and probably weird and clumsy, but chances are your mind is gonna pay a lot closer attention to that because it's also a novel experience. Um, with this client, we also noted uh, it, it, when he's tired, when he's stressed, he knows, like my my body is not showing up for me. Um, I'm too tired. It's too late. You know, weekends were better in terms of like I'm rested. We don't have a lot on the agenda. Um, one of the other things that that he noticed as well was if he um, and here's a thing that sometimes I know clients will do. They start to get an erection 
And then they're like, okay, let's go right now because my erection showed up and it's here. Let's take advantage of it. The problem might be their body's not quite as warmed up as it could be, you know? And the other thing is if you wait a little bit and focus on your partner, sometimes your own uh, desire and arousal can really become elevated based on your partner's arousal level. So we talked about this with this client. He noticed that when his partner would get really turned on, all of a sudden, you know, he noticed, oh, look, my body's really responding to you being turned on. So there is a whole thing about, can you slow down? Can you savor the experience? Can you have a wider repertoire of sexual items on your menu that you can pivot to, you know, if the erection happens all the time in sex, in an, in an unstressed, like not too freaked out way, can you pivot to something else that still feels pleasurable and connecting between the two of you um, and let go of things of goals? If we don't have penetrative sex, it wasn't good. If I don't have an orgasm, if you don't have an orgasm, if we don't orgasm together, somehow it wasn't good. That goal-oriented sex is something we are often trying to work with clients to breathe through and let go of and embrace. Like, you're at the sexual buffet. Why don't you sample from the whole array of items in front of you and co-create erotically with your partner to see what might be of interest? What might turn you on? Is there stuff you haven't tried with each other before that doesn't involve, by the way, a hard penis in any way, but is also really interesting and fun and pleasurable? Um, so I will say these two, um, they're about to get married. They're doing great. Uh, it's It's been a delight to work with them both. And um, if you'll go to the next slide, his partner was really lovely. She actually came in and sometimes we'll bring partners in and just talk and say, hey, you know, let's talk about your experience. And, and, and often the partners will say, what, what can I do to support um, my partner? And the biggest one is don't personalize this. Try not to personalize it. You know, bodies do what they do. They change over time. People come to the table with different levels of, you know, testosterone and physical health and things like that. And, um, and Aaron, you want to, you want to help me out here with this? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. So I, I'm, yeah, I, I, it's so funny because a lot of our clients um, come to us and, and, you know, they don't necessarily know what it is that they want to do. They're, they're, uh, they have a lot of anxiety. They have uh, a ton of questions, you know, well, if my partner cannot perform, what am I going to do? And, and so on and so forth. And as you mentioned, one of the most important things is just letting go of those sexual goals, um, letting go of what we consider penetrative sex, um, focusing a lot on a lot of uh, the the sexual salad bar, as you mentioned, Chris, I often tell my clients, uh, often tell the female partner in the relationship, if they're in a relationship with a partner who, a uh, male partner who's experiencing uh, orgasm, I'm sorry, not orgasms, erectile dysfunction, is focusing on uh, the foreplay. And what that may look like is, they may look like you guys um, cooking dinner together and uh, you feed each other. That may be the sensual uh, touch that you focused on a few slides ago, Chris. That also may be, you know, just subtle holding hands and watching a movie together and possibly rubbing on uh, each other. Uh, it focuses and takes the pressure off of creating this goal that you have to have sex in order to be satisfied. Thanks, thanks, Aaron. Um, this, we wanted to offer you all some resources uh, to check into. Um, the first one, Coping with Erectile Dysfunction, that is this book, 
by Michael Metz and Barry McCarthy. It's a great book. Um, it's comprehensive. It's got tons of good suggestions in it. Highly recommend. Um, the Hard Conversations podcast is, is a great series of conversations around like looking at erectile issues from a lot of different angles um, and really a, a beautiful amount of education in it. Um, mindfulness practices to help you drop into your body and get out of your anxious thoughts when they crop up. Um, again, working with fantastic urologists like Dr. Baga and the folks at Advanced Urology. Um, and, and maybe Dr. Baga will talk about this a little bit. Um, I have also had clients who work with a pelvic floor therapist sometimes um, in order to deal with, uh, sometimes folks, pelvic floor muscles are contracted and they, they're not fully aware of that. And it's impacting the ability to get and maintain erections. Um, and I will just mention this other book, which is not on the list. This is Ian Kerner's book, She Comes First. Um, it was actually written initially for uh, folks who uh, deal with rapid ejaculation as a way to you know, really please your partner, expand the sexual play between the two, two partners. And um, it's got a lot of great suggestions in it. So um, with that, I know our presentation actually went a little longer than I thought it would, but I wanted to give a chance to answer any questions. Uh, I know we got a couple of them. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to shout these out. Um, and Dr. Baga, I think these first couple are definitely for you. Um, first question is, what are ways to boost testosterone? You are on mute. All right, awesome, thank you. That's a great question. There are natural ways to boost testosterone and then there are medical ways to boost testosterone. First of all, I always check a full hormonal panel. So you can check a testosterone level in isolation, but that's not always as helpful as one might think. It's a nice screening tool, but you need to have a little more information because when you do a full hormonal panel, you'll learn a little bit more about what's causing that discrepancy in erectile, or sorry, in testosterone levels. Um, you know, how much of it is free. So there's a bioavailable testosterone and then there's a total testosterone. Just having a really high total testosterone is not that useful if the bioavailable, the part that your body can actually use, is very low. So you kind of got to look at it in a little bit of a multifactorial way before you make those decisions. But in any event, there's always natural ways to do it, which are safe. A good night's sleep, you want to get at least, I know it's hard to say, I can't even do it, but eight hours of sleep as an ideal, if you can. That really helps your body regenerate in many ways, including allowing testosterone production. Uh, you want to have a good amount of cardiovascular exercise. That has been proven to improve testosterone levels. You want to avoid uh, inflammatory activities, specifically smoking. Smoking has been found to make testosterone levels really go down. So avoiding that secondhand smoke as well can make a huge difference in terms of helping you boost your testosterone levels on your own. Beyond that, there are medications, you know? So, you know, one thing I always tell people is they ask me about the, about the stuff that's over the counter, like GNC and things like that. What they have are DHEA supplements. And the DHEA supplements is what they're trying to do is they're trying to use precursors for testosterone and hopefully, if they give you the precursor, your body will turn it into testosterone. It doesn't always work, although I will tell you, it's also not a total scam. You know, I have had some patients that really wanted to check and see if they could get a boost from it. And a few have, but a lot haven't as well. So, you know, it's a reasonable thing to do. You just don't want to go over because the problem with those supplements is that they've got what's called, um, they get... Uh, they get processed in the liver to some degree. And so if you're using unreasonable amounts or going beyond the recommended amounts um, or using an impure product, it can actually cause liver issues. So we try to avoid that. But otherwise we can give you patches, we can give you injections, we can give you gels. Uh, we can also uh, do little implants of little pellets that I'll put underneath the skin that'll last for between three to six months with a two to three minute procedure and slowly dissolve over time. 
give you a nice even keel of testosterone supplementation. So there are a lot of different ways that we can kind of help solve that. There are also medications I can give you to make the testis work harder. So your body can naturally create its own testosterone um, rather than giving the direct pure form. So there's a lot of options there. That's great to know. Um, it's nice to hear that there are so many options. Um, here's right. another question uh, for you, Dr. Baga, which is, um, this is a question from uh, one of the participants. Why is it that my Viagra works sometimes, but other times it doesn't? Okay, so, you know, a few things. One thing is that there are a few things about Viagra not everyone um, talks about too often. One is it can actually be affected by the food that you eat. So if you have a really high fat meal, that fatty meal will actually absorb some of the Viagra and it won't make it to where it needs to be because it'll just get absorbed. So you want to have it with a lean meal or frankly, even with an empty stomach and it actually can make a difference uh, in terms of its potency. Uh, the other thing is, of course, you want to make sure you're taking the right dose and getting it from a, you know, from a reputable source. A lot of times I will give people 100 milligram tablets and tell them just to break it in half. For some reason, 25, 50, or 100 is all the same price, so it doesn't make sense to me. You should you know, get less for your money, so I tell them to break it in half. Just make sure you're using a pill cutter, things like that. But most importantly, you've got to consider that erectile dysfunction can be multifactorial, meaning it can be occurring for multiple different reasons. So, you know, you may have a vascular issue because a lot of us do as we get older that, you know, arterial disease occurs to a very high proportion of the population. And so the Viagra is working against that, but you could also have some situational anxiety. You could be having some performance anxiety. You could have, you know, what Aaron and Chris are talking about, about having this super tentorial or meaning, you know, this uh, idea of what a, what you're supposed to be doing and then that sympathetic nervous system getting um, increased and sending signals to the penis that it's not time to have an erection because you're not ready for it, you know. So you've got to consider that Viagra isn't always the singular answer. There could be other things going on as well um, that need to be investigated. So I, ha I have two more questions. Do we have time for that? Feeling good? Let's do it. Okay. Um, how, do, how do I deal with premature ejaculation? So that is a, that's a difficult problem. It really is. You know, the, I actually have people on the other end of the spectrum where they don't have enough sensation and they can't ejaculate and they can't orgasm, which are two separate things, by the way, um, at all because they don't get enough sensation. Premature ejaculation actually occurs because on the other end of the, end, end of the spectrum where their sensation is just too great, so they get stimulated too quickly, uh, but it doesn't work well for a relationship because it may not work out for your partner. There are some behavioral techniques that can be utilized. Uh, so, you know, you can use a, uh, a condom or some sort of barrier to kind of decrease the amount of sensation during sexual activity. You can use creams, so slightly numbing creams that can be prescribed that slightly dull the, the, uh, the ability to feel the sensation so you last a little bit longer as well. Uh, another uh, commonly used technique is to masturbate 12 hours prior to sexual activity because the nerves, once they've been stimulated, the next time, if it's been a shorter period of time, it takes longer to stimulate them again. So that's one way. Um, there's a start-stop technique where when you think you're, you start to learn your body and when you think you're about to ejaculate, you stop and you can actually squeeze the tip of the penis and that sends a bit of a signal to decrease the likelihood of having an orgasm at that time. So there are these things. There are medications as well that we can use. Um, I only use those in the most severe cases because what they're doing is they're dulling the nerves. So they can dull the nerves throughout the body. Uh, but you know, I would actually love to hear from both you, Aaron and Chris as well, do you all have strategies to kind of help with premature ejaculation as well when I don't want to go to the medications, you know, because I'm worried about their side effects? Um, well, it's interesting because I will say in terms of the medications, my understanding is that SSRIs are often given off label as a treatment for uh, early ejaculation. Um, some of the techniques I think around edging 
which I think is a little bit what you're talking about, the on off technique. So when, you know, you're, you're probably through solo play, through self-pleasuring, you're working with or with a partner, you know, becoming aroused and then stopping the action or like when you're kind of on the edge and having your body kind of get used to a little bit more of that sensation of uh, delaying getting to orgasmic inevitability. Um, I think that's the first, that's kind of the major one that comes to mind. Aaron, do you have anything else? Yeah, I, I would also add uh, foreplay is is very important. You know, a lot of times when we're thinking about, uh, you know, or anticipating having sex, it sends, you know, those neurons to our brains. And what we're saying is, oh my gosh, I'm going to have sex. And that creates some anxiety as well as creating this, this understanding that I'm going to have to perform often. So foreplay slows it down, as Dr. Baga uh, mentioned, and it slows it down to the extent that um, we're not necessarily focused on sex. We're in the moment and we're focused on pleasing our partner or even pleasing ourselves. So um, I think all of you had uh, great responses to that. So the last question I have, which I think is um, geared towards us a little bit, which is uh, what is the price of therapy for ED? Um, I wish I had a straightforward answer for you. Um, I think as you can probably hear, it really depends on the individual that we're working with and what the factors are that are in play. If there are significant relational factors we're going to want to have some, we're going to do, want to do some couples work. Um, it, it really, I mean, I, I, I wish I could just tell you, it takes like seven sessions and this is how much they cost, but it's a, it's a little, it's not a linear process as it turns out, you know, it's collaborative, it's comprehensive, it's multifactorial. Um, and if we are working with other care providers to um, support your care in a collaborative and comprehensive way. It just depends on what that's going to look like for each individual involved. So I want to say thank you to everyone. I know that we just ran over um, by a bit. Um, I appreciate you staying here. Uh, this is going to be this recording is going to be put up on I know advanced urologies YouTube site, I believe, if I understand correctly. Um, and let's see, uh, it, someone asked a question about could they get these slides? And if you will reach out to one of us, we'll get the slides to you. You can reach out to Advanced Urology or you can reach out um, at our contact information here. Happy to share those with you. And thank you everyone. And thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Dr. Baga. Thank you everyone for coming and staying and we really appreciate it.